where where do you stand with all of this, especially when it comes to the AI? You know, like when you hear AI, so, so some people are like, let it do what it wants to do. Others are like, no, we need to control this thing. I want the future where AI runs our entire economy. I think that's going to be great. It's going to be a world of abundance. I absolutely want that to happen. Then an opportunity came around to uh, work with Elon and his foundation. So I quit poker at the time and decided to focus on philanthropy full time. Young people, I mean 18, 16, 17, 18, have to go on dating sites in order to meet other people. Yeah, so... Well, Igor, good evening and thanks so much for coming on. I feel so um, privileged because I know you have not been on too many podcasts yet, but... Uh, and I'm just like, how come no one hears from Igor on podcasts? The guy has so much to say, so thanks for, being, thanks for coming on mine. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Um, speaking a lot doesn't necessarily mean having a lot to say, I suppose, but oh. that's how you know me. Uh, I I uh, never enjoyed the being in the public that much. I uh, kind of stayed away from it, never was on social media very much. And uh, that changed when we founded REC, and then I had a reason to be a bit more public. And currently it's the case again where I feel like a few topics are missing some synthesis and while they're very relevant and I feel like I've been around them for long enough that I can be helpful around that. So that's why I've decided to just go on a few more podcasts now. Let us get started with first things first. Uh, Igor, please tell us your story, how things got started for you. So just, I, yeah, just tell us. Mm -hmm. How far do you want me to start back? <laughs> I want you to go back to where you were born, actually, because, you know, unlike okay. uh, many people, yeah, it, it's all connected. All right. um, yeah, I was I was born in Russia and uh, we moved out when I was four years old. So I have small amount of memories from there still and uh, ended up growing up in Germany, Western Germany, Dortmund, mm -hmm. uh, until I moved to Munich to go to university and study math there. But after a couple of years, I noticed that I don't want to become a math professor after all. Mm -hmm. And the path I was on was anyway going to be more likely one where I was going to do financial models for a bank or an insurance company, mm -hmm. uh, as many mathematicians who like also have some desire, especially if they're immigrants, kind of want to earn some money then end up doing. Uh, so I, during university, started playing poker as well as just a side income and uh, was earning something like $1,500 a month for a few months in a row and while only playing a few hours. And then I just projected where this could go if I put in all of my time and uh, tried it out for a few months and then came back home and told my parents that I've decided to <laughs> drop out of university and instead pursue poker and travel around the world, with, to which they reacted with, we're against this. And I was had to explain that that was already a done decision rather than a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't very pleased, but they remained supportive still, still hoping that I would at some point return back to university. Uh, and then I ended up playing poker for probably like nine, 10 years mm -hmm. professionally, traveling uh, continuously around the world, live poker and online poker. So you end up playing a lot online where you play, say, 10 to 20 times as many hands per hour and you learn much faster. And then the high stakes, you play around the world in, in, in person, in casinos, and that was that was very fun. It was great to just at such a young age be able to travel the world, obviously. Uh, at some point, I realized that poker is a pretty self-serving pursuit. <laughs> There's a bit of entertainment value that it creates, I suppose, for people when the, uh, they watch you play and also in person. Uh, so after a few years, um, my partner Liv and I and a couple other friends decided to found a philanthropic organization. It was called Rec Charity, where we donated ourselves and raised from other poker players uh, for uh, effective charities that were selected by other organizations, particularly that were influenced by effective altruism at the time. And we founded that in 2014, and it always took up about 20% of my time or so. And then in 2020, I, when COVID came around, uh, didn't play much and started doing this coaching exchange where I would teach few people from Bridgewater poker, and they would teach me macroeconomics in return. And that just excited me much more to learn 
yeah, about other pursuits, as I have been, of course, like with Rack beforehand as well. But it really just showed me that I enjoy full time learning more than poker. So I quit poker at the time and decided to focus on philanthropy full time. And then an opportunity came around to uh, work with Elon and his foundation. So I then uh, worked for the Musk Foundation for um, duration of 2021 and 2022. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was great to basically take many of the same goals that we had with Reg at a, and pursue them at a much larger scale with the Musk Foundation. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, that has come to an end. And now I do still some philanthropic advisory as well as a project, which I'm excited to see where it goes. It began as a hobby project, but it actually might become something else soon. Super cool. Uh, before we go more into the whole EA thing, philanthropy, that whole world, um, I was interested in hearing more from you about uh, the poker game Fury, uh, because it seems like, you know, there, it's something that's, it's pretty big for you. So uh, can you walk us through that? Yeah. Um, so poker you, is known as a mainly for probably its bluffing aspect as part of the game and the whole psychology and bluffing does is is a very large part of it and when i started playing in 2009 10 it actually was the most important part probably as well basically the street smarts that someone has to have to be a good poker player but then over the years and particularly 2015 16 with uh, better software coming out that allowed you to figure out in more detail for every situation that you could run into what you should end up doing. Mm -hmm. uh, it ended up being the case that the people that became the best players were the ones that just studied in front of their computer the most and kind of like studying for an exam, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so that really changed the ratio between how much theoretical studying versus just natural talent you had to bring where it was like this before and then it became like that and uh it basically since since those years it has become a very different game and also it became kind of clear that soon enough bots will be beating poker online so once once ai started beating humans in 2017 uh i also saw my time as being quite limited <laughs> within poker Interesting. Interesting. Do you feel like the poker world is getting is preparing for that, or many of them have not realized what you what you have realized already? Yeah. So many of them have been have realized it over the last couple of years. I'm not following it very much right now, but I've seen that it's 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 a discussion. There are more cheating scandals of the type where a player is using uh, software to, as an life assistant, um, and. I think long term, it's just like many security situations. It's just a cat and mouse game. Mm -hmm. A new thing comes out that manages to overcome the security systems, and then they manage to counteract that. And then again, new thing comes out, etc. I think it's going to go on for a while. So it's going to be hard to play high stakes poker online, probably indefinitely, except for in trusted circles where you maybe have a club or something of people that you already know, or there's maybe a vouching system. Yeah. I could see that. The alternative that I was actually working on with a friend who was running a poker site at the time in 2020 is to develop alternative poker variants, which are sufficiently different that uh, software cannot be very helpful. You just have to make the total game state of poker even more complex than it is. So the total amount of situations you can find yourself in. It's usually a good metric to how complex a game is. And the more complex a game is, the harder it is, or the more computationally intense it would be to solve that game as well. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and then going back, so now going into what it is that you seem more focused on these days, uh, it seems like um, philanthropy came in early to you, the interest into philanthropy. Can you tell us what led you um, to the interest you have developed into uh, effective altruism? And mm -hmm. also the level of commitment you've had or that you maybe still currently have, as well as to what extent uh, do you feel like you've been disillusioned, you know, by um, um, about EA due to, you know, you and me and others, we all heard about, you know, when the whole boss terms things came out, came about, you know, things that uh, resurfaced of him 
having very derogatory, you know, comments and views of black people. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's the whole SBF thing and, uh, you know, yeah, people talking about, you know, sexual boundaries within the workplace and the fiduciary duties to investors. So, so yeah, so going back to just all of that, like, how did you, how, how did you get interested into this, into this uh, movement, that field? And then where, where are you standing today uh, in light of mm -hmm. everything that has transpired uh, more recently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my initial interest in philanthropy started when I was a teenager. I just on weekends regularly uh, work at a soup kitchen in town mm -hmm. and uh, talk to the homeless people there, just kind of wonder how that even came to be that people are in that situation in Germany, which has really relatively good uh, welfare programs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and then over time, I kind of got a bit disillusioned with the approach that was taken. It didn't seem to address or help that many things, kind of the classic philanthropy approach that was around me, um, even though the soup kitchens were still helpful. And I didn't focus on charity very much then for the next years. So I didn't focus very much in, on charity in my early 20s. And then a few friends just shared some articles uh, about effective altruism in 2013. And I read about it. And a lot of the ideas and claims j around philanthropy just made much more sense to me. I thought they were much more logical and trying to actually apply a scientific framework to uh, giving rather than follow kind of a low experimentation, low feedback intake uh, process as it's often done, mm -hmm. where it's kind of mostly a marketing game rather than a scientific game, I find in many situations. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, from there, we kind of just were at the same time learning ourselves about it and uh, donating to organizations within various areas across like human suffering, alleviation today, uh, animal welfare, and uh, existential risk prevention. Those were the three main buckets. And I think that the uh, ideas around it are remain valid with whatever one thinks of the structures that developed uh, around EA and the issues that it had. So similarly, I think that the question of um, whether you should, uh, it, well, not you should, but whether say you're aiming to donate to um, malaria prevention, and it is something where you can uh, actually have uh, look at some data and look at whether this medicine or this distribution of bed nets achieved higher prevention over time. Mm -hmm. And I think if you care about uh, helping more than fewer people, then this is an area where it just makes sense to use a quantified approach and kind of donate under, under those um, ideas. And I think the same applies to many other areas as well. And those ideas stand really by themselves, I think. Similarly, uh, much of the existential risk prevention stuff, I think, uses a very sensible framework around considering what kind of the large potential pains of the future are, mm -hmm. uh, which ones can be addressed at all, mm -hmm. and um, where a lot of effort is already going to or very little effort is going towards presently. Mm -hmm. I think those are good thoughts, kind of independently of many of the EA issues. Mm -hmm. I think, so on the question of the disillusionment with EA, um, I highlighted the parts that I think are good about it because I think they really do stand one for themselves. And two, um, there is, I think, a thing that happened with EA, which is kind of, I, I've been in my mind calling it small EA versus big EA, mm. where there is a question of, do you apply this EA type thinking to a subset of problems in the world? Or do you try to now assume that this way of thinking applies to really everything, uh, yeah. to your life philosophy and everything else as well? And I think that a mistake that has happened is that people believe that it would be smart to just apply it to everything. Yeah. And I think that that's where you can go wrong. Um, and uh, if you apply it to the small parts, basically, if you apply it to the areas that are quantifiable within charity, 
then you will get better better results by applying an EA EA mind. But EA is not very good at uh, understanding systemic risks or systemic issues, for example, because it's just not something where its frameworks have been developed to the same degree as its its um, quantifying frameworks have been. That's very true. Um... I guess this takes me then to um, where is it that you stand um, in terms of uh, when you think about the earlier focus that EA, uh, the EA um, seems to have had, you know, we, Liv and I were talking about it the other day, you know, when you look at uh, the percentage of um, where the EA um, donations have gone to, it seems like at least in the early days, almost all of it uh, went to trying and solving the global poverty. A, a lot of it went towards that you know, and uh, issues along those lines. But uh, more recently, it seems that, um, you know, there is an emphasis um, on, um, and this I'm going to be very interested in your thoughts of, with Liv, we talked about, uh, you know, long-termism. But with you, I want to go more into something even more precise, which is, uh, you know, um, the effective accelerationism, right? Um, so wh wh what are what are your takes on all of that? And is it what you were trying to refer to when earlier you said um, small, I wrote it down, you said small EA and, you know, just small EA is one thing, but you think something maybe not advisable has been happening because people then are trying to apply that to pretty much all of the realms of life. Is that what you were thinking about or? Yeah, so... I mean, part of how one can misapply it, it's you're, you're learning that you should quantify things and then you start quantifying your day-to-day -day life and your relationships with other humans, et cetera. And it's just that we can't really, <laughs> right? It's if, if, if you're trying now to be um, kind of numbers-based about how much time you spend with your loved one and when you spend it is it effective and are you trading that off correctly versus your time at work it's it's okay to have that a little bit i think in the background running but being kind of um obsessive about it just makes you probably not a uh i don't know i don't, I don't think it makes you a good partner probably it, it becomes pretty weird because you just can go too far and now you're starting there are a lot of things, basically, I think, in the day-to-day -day and of, of what it is that we humans do, which are not yet uh, easily quantifiable. So then when you end up using quantified mindset to it, you're probably going to be overemphasizing the things that are easily quantified and underemphasizing the ones that are not. And that's basically just a general mistake that can happen. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, on the question of... Uh, sorry, which, which, which other part? Yeah, the like, yeah. like we're... Before, Basically, for you to talk more about the, um, you know, how you're seeing the early emphasis of the early emphasis of uh, EA that was on global mm -hmm. poverty and such, to now it may look like we're going towards, you know, the acceleration, accelerationism, you know, effective acceleration. <laughs> this whole big focus on, you know, tech and uh, innovation uh, without limits, and you know, just like innovation for innovation's sake. Um, mm -hmm. I know that is something that's really working, but something that you have a lot in your mind and it's part of what you work on a lot. So I, I want to know, I would love to hear where you stand with all of this by now. And uh, if I should mm -hmm. just, yeah, yeah. anyway, I, I would love to hear that. Yeah. So yeah, initially EA was much more, as you say, focused on um, human suffering alleviation today, basically that bucket uh, of, of things. And I don't know, I it's don't want to prescribe to people what they should be focusing on. Right. Mm -hmm. So EA is not a, um, or at least hasn't been. And I think still isn't a monolith of kind of like a top down telling everyone what they should be focusing on. There are a few organizations that have, um, more influence as it is with any kind of part of life, really due to them having either, more charismatic or powerful leaders or because they have more funding. So, and those individuals have uh, later started focusing on other areas as well. And I think it is their choice to focus on other areas. So I don't really want to uh, fault them for it in a way, because also I think that it's, it's, it's a good focus that was uh, neglected beforehand anyway, the focus on long-termism and existential risk prevention. 
That said, uh, a lot of the um, global poverty work still exists today and actually it is also still larger today. It's just that the growth of the global poverty giving has had a uh, not as sharp an increase as the growth of the existential risk prevention giving. But I think the total per year amount, even in 22 and 23, was probably still larger for global poverty than for than it was for existential risk prevention. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think that uh, a lot of the work around existential risk prevention is quite prescient, actually. Um, and it was... Uh, it was correct to worry about uh, pandemic risks uh, prior to COVID, and it is still, I think, good to work on that. Uh, similarly, uh, the work on AI safety, I think, is of very high potential value. It's not to say that it might be that the specific things that are being done are not very high value, but it's also, at least up, up until a couple of years ago, it was very hard to know which particular work would be very useful. And probably the work that they were doing was too theoretical rather than practical. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, um, the EAC movement that you mentioned, actually, it's a, it's a counter movement that emerged uh, over the last one and a half years or so, uh, counter to EA. Uh, it has the belief that, um, yeah, it was basically founded on, on kind of the main ideas were that top-down control and centralized structures can be corrupted and are generally dangerous and to be avoided, uh, which I think is roughly right. And then also that safety can be a veneer for control, which I also think is right. And that optimism was lacking significantly in the world. Uh, we're talking about mid-22, kind of post-COVID or in some parts of the world still mid-COVID uh, situation. So they were really... Uh, an anti-EA movement that came together. And they, as you said, believed that, hey, um, to lead to a better future, we should accelerate technological progress in all domains to the maximum, Um, which is counter to the idea that many EAs have that in particular around biology and AI, we should first make sure that that which we are building is going to lead to the outcomes that we want rather than just kind of build it and try to uh, solve the failures later. Because the belief along, among many people in EA, but also many people outside of it, is that the harms that can be created through um, bio, bio develop, biotech and through um, AI tech uh, can just be very significant, kind of on the scale of the harms on uh, nuclear war. Hmm. Hmm. It's actually very interesting when I hear you um, describe it this way, Igor, because for me, I, for some bizarre reason, because you're describing them as two, um, two movements that were kind of very distinct from one another. But for some reason, I had the feeling that EA came out of uh, a subset of EA, isn't it? Am I? Am I? Am uh, I don't I, think it, I don't. Th- I don't think it did. So the initial That's founders of EAC yeah. were definitely not EAs. But maybe the thing you're picking up on is there is a significant overlap within the um, where the people come from. So a lot of the kind of working on existential risk EAs live in broader Bay Area and uh, nowadays work on um, AI safety, but also on AI cap- capability development at um, AI companies. And similarly, the EACs care a lot about where AI goes. So there is a lot of conversation generally happening from both sides about the topic of AI and how one should develop it in a way such that it benefits uh, civilization the most. While the actual approach that each of them suggests is very different. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is where I'm going to want you to try to walk us into some subtlety, because that's one of the things I appreciate the most about you is that um, you you don't have a tendency of being an an extreme on either end. Uh, I love how you're always like very, you know, um, balanced. So when you look at those two, yeah, here, 
IAC over here. Do you feel like there is a place where they can be, you know, like um, reconciled and or a world in which, you know, the two of them come together to give us a better world? Or do they have act, do they have um, characteristics uh, in in each of them that makes it that we're going to have to choose one or the other? Like, where, mm-hmm. where do you stand with all of this, especially when it comes to the AI? You know, like when you hear AI, so, so some people are like, let it do what it wants to do. Others are like, no, we need to control this thing. Where I know you're somewhere, you know, you're very, uh, you're very subtle about all of this. Yeah, uh, I think there's a lot of um, not even middle ground, but rather both uh, groups that seem to be diametrically opposed, actually wanting the same thing. So if we look at it from a high level, then basically the things that both are saying that are similar are uh, artificial and in- one artificial intelligence will be. Uh, or already is the most important technology of our time. And two, it will develop within decades or even years to be so powerful that it will be integrated into basically every part of our economy and will run a lot of our economy as well. So both groups believe that. And then three, um, both groups also believe that therefore AI ought to be developed in a way that benefits civilization the most. Uh, and here's where it comes a little bit apart. Uh, it's like, what do you define as civilization? Do you look at just anything that's conscious? Do you look at even maybe the whole eco and biosphere? Or do you look at humans only, right? And different people have different beliefs about what matters to them the most. And I don't think there is a strict truth answer to it. It is, in my opinion, at least dependent really on your beliefs, whether you focus more on humans or all animal life forms or, yeah, or all consciousness in the first place. So that anyway, so like, because this is true for both groups, there should actually be a lot of um, work together, right? Because they basically have a very similar core premises and they have a similar end goal that they want. The difference, and this is where I'll, I don't know, it, it, it would nearly be better to have an EAC then on the side as well, because I, I haven't, I'm going to try to steel man their thing, but I do think that it is, unfortunately, um, their their way of dealing with it is unfortunately pretty bad faith in some of the situations. Mm. So they, I generally, when you have the same premises and the same goal, then you're now, you should now be together in a search for truth to find out what the best path is to get from A to B, right? Because both believe in A and both believe that B is the goal. Right. And, but it hasn't been the case, uh, at least in my experience, that IAC was very interested in a true search for understanding what the best path is to get there. Instead, they are very convinced that the best path is, um, kind of a very decentralized, uh, permissionless, letting everyone do the thing that they want to do to the maximum degree. There should be very little uh, restrictions and control on what anyone develops. And their belief is that um, through this process of everyone doing whatever they want with AI, basically, there will also be enough balance in the system through something they describe as the homo techno capital mimetic machine. So just kind of markets, I suppose, across these uh, domains, that there would be enough balance such that the system overall never breaks. And that by itself is kind of a, an insane assumption, in my view, like this, this is, this may have been the case prior to us developing such civilization ending tech like nuclear weapons. But why would there be any magical enforcement of balance of power such that you can never have one thing run away and destroy the whole playing field, basically? That is very much possible with nuclear weapons, right? It's it's not the case that you distribute nuclear weapons everywhere and now there is like, oh, wow, great. We will never have um, n- full-out nuclear war. Yeah. I mean, one, one could right now point at the uh, 75 years or 80 years now nearly of like us having nuclear weapons and no war having happened. But this is also um, 
<laughs> a bit of survivorship bias. We wouldn't yeah. be looking back at the world where full-out nuclear war happened and be talking about it necessarily, right? For one. And then second as, as well, that there were a number of really, really close calls with us uh, avoiding nuclear war just just ever so ne tightly. That's right. That's anyway, right. so my point with EIC is they basically have this belief in some like magical invisible hand of thermodynamics that keeps everything in check and never allows for uh, some power to destroy the whole playing field. And I don't think that's based on anything, unfortunately, since we have developed this power. And on the other hand, there are EAs who believe that uh, this could very much happen uh, and we should, and basically the cost of such an event is so large if uh, of, say, a civilization ending uh, or civilization curtailing um, explosion of power or of energy or of whatever, that it, the cost of that is so large that it might make sense to actually put in um, some potentially restrictive mean, means over that period of time where this then doesn't occur. And I think that um, it is a very valid concern. And this is where kind of the two can come back together. The thing that the EX then to the, as a response to this EA point, or I don't know, the safety point of many folks outside of EA as well, would say that, yeah, but it is that centralized structure that you build in um, while attempting to kind of reduce any single actor doing something very bad. You're creating a single point of failure where now you have given so much power to this one centralized uh, entity that one, it's kind of extreme power will corrupt it anyway, yeah. uh, but also, uh, which we have seen many times, and that is a valid concern, right? Okay. Or it can be um, infiltrated by someone else and then kind of misused for total totalitarian control over time endlessly and by that curtailing civilization as well. And to that I say is, that's exactly right. That is absolutely a terrible worry, and this needs to be avoided as well. And that is a worry as well that people in existential risk prevention do consider. Like they, it's been called many things, um, like value lock-in. Basically, imagine the Nazis winning the war and then getting control all over the world, right? And now they're just like pushing down the Nazi values continuously. And that is basically a civilization ending if it really remains to be the case that they stay in power and there is no variance, no new thing emerging and no progress that allows for like many uh, flowers to bloom, much, much flourishing to happen afterwards. So I think they should, what, what actually should happen is it is a true and relevant question to figure out whether an instance is such that um, it requires more safety and control or whether it is overusing safety and control and now the safety and control is becoming dangerous itself. I think that's a very valid question, but it does need to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis because, and this is where kind of both would be wrong, is if they just use the same approach to every single situation ever, that would be insane. It would be, it's very unlikely that just using the same approach to every single situation is exactly correct. But um, so when I when I hear about um, Igor, I the people who worry about um, a controlling more or less of a centralized controlling you know um, uh, 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 um, entity or whatever you want to call it. I definitely know that by now I have grown so suspicious and not comfortable with anything that can, you know, have that po the power to basically, you know, like that controlling power for all the reasons that you that you specified. So for someone like me, at least, I'm just like, okay, that is almost like off the table. But I'm willing to hear what you're saying. But maybe there are some some, some instances where that might be not too worrisome and and that's gonna that's a question i'll have for you but let me just finish here so for me that that one is more or less off the table because of what we talked about and then if i look at the other side um in this case for the 
you know, the acceleration, accelerationism, I should probably just say EAC because I have a hard time with that word. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the EAC side and uh, hearing what you're talking about, which is what we're seeing, um, don't you feel that maybe there my biggest worry always, including with the nuclear weapons today, is as long as we deal with somewhat rational human beings that are not crazy yet, maybe maybe we're, you know it's going to be a self self preservation from somebody pushing that button, you know, knowing that they'll be wiped out the next second as well. So, but that's not something you know. But recently, looking at the at the at the characters that have come come to power, I'm not sure anymore that we can. And so but me there, that's what worries me the most. It's like, um, even if we had a nicely decentralized uh, situation, what prevents rogue from taking us all out, like a rogue actor from taking us all out. And even if we, uh, even if we all are, and, we, and on top of that, is there a way that maybe the decentralization they talk about could someone like you be satisfied with maybe coming up with something where uh, it takes extra steps? It's not one per there's decentralization, so you cannot do anything by yourself. But even there, I'm also worried that, um, you know, like when you look at how the DAO functions, for example, uh, even there, we're kind of working our way back towards creating some type of uh, mini control, you know, who has the more... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these things are not perfect either. So I see what mm -hmm. you're saying, but I guess I would sum up by just saying, <laughs> I'm still on that camp though of can we try the decentralized pathway, taking mm -hmm. into account these other things. So not sure if I'm being clear here, Igor, if I'm making sense. No, I, I understand. I, 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 and I agree. Again, uh, I want to repeat that the, <laughs> I think any time you restrict freedoms, there better be an extremely, extremely good reason. The bar is extremely, extremely high for it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and th at the same time, um, there can not all of the um, kind of centralizing structures have led to bad things. So we had a kind of anarchy initially around the nuclear weapons pro proliferation. And a bunch of countries had them. Well, not a bunch. It's like ended up being about nine. Um, but nine countries had them, and we had 60,000 nuclear weapons among those countries. And then the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was made, which is basically a bunch of the countries agreeing together um, to a code of action, yeah. um, which is uh, something that they agreed to together and then uh, started disarming and reducing their nuclear weapons. And now there are only like 13,000 or so in the world. Mm -hmm. And that is the type of um, kind of like central coordination that I think can also be achieved around um, AI development and biodevelopment as well, um, where the benefits just outweigh the costs, basically, where the cost hasn't been very large uh, from reducing the number of nuclear weapons at the time when we could destroy each other multiple times over anyway already, right? But there uh, are benefits because you don't need to develop as many weapons anymore. So the country doesn't have to spend as many, as much of their tax dollars on uh, the that part of the military anymore, etc. cetera. Uh, or the IAEA has also been used as a model that now some of the AI companies look at to figure out how to have um, coordination between them, right? It doesn't have to be... Basically, there's a lot of space in between full decentralization and kind of like a one global government. It is like the thing that I often find is this false dichotomy that is being created by, in part, the EX of just... Um, claiming that there isn't any space, right? It's like as if you either create global government that where one Klaus Schwab of the WEF controls everyone, or it is full decentralization where everyone is kind of permissionlessly developing whatever they want. There's a lot of space in between. Uh, similarly, there's a lot of, like, it doesn't make sense that you either maximally accelerate all technology at all times, or you decelerate it. No, there is also space in between, yet again, where you can 
accelerate safe technologies. And it's like, okay, people will again be annoyed at the word safe, but you can accelerate, say, narrow AI technologies, right? I'm not worried about mid-journey um, creating a lot of harm uh, to civilization, except for like harm to artists, etc., which obviously also has its harms, but um, there's probably also going to be a counter reaction to that. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there are other uses of such technologies where, and I wonder whether you, would you be okay with, say we develop uh, a way through AI and biotech together for a billion people to have access to a pathogen that is that can start a pandemic. And all it takes is basically having $100 with which you can order it from a DNA synthesis machine that sits somewhere um, that is not regulated. So you need $100 to order it from there. And you don't know exactly what to order. So you're asking your biotech GPT what to develop such that it can be ordered. And maybe it's, it says, oh, you can just order smallpox, but smallpox actually has been ordered by this New York Times uh, reporter in 2017, and he had it at home. And he was like, why, why do I have smallpox? <laughs> like, why, why is this possible in this world? It's kind of crazy. Wow. Um, anyway, so maybe it will tell you, well, actually, this one they looked at. So then you ask, well, can you develop a slightly different pathogen than smallpox such that it would pass through some filters, but I would still be able to create a pandemic, maybe actually make it a bit more virulent as well while you're at it. And yeah. it's not that far from uh, where we are presently. Like presently, we're still not there that you can do it. And there are like safety mechanisms put in uh, to the um, kind of uh, most advanced models. But if you just go further by five years, then maybe this is where we're going to be. And at that point, we probably, I, I, I don't know, are you comfortable with that world where like really everyone can order for $100 or maybe $1,000 and an LLM and a, which makes some plans for you once it can do that and a bio GPT uh, can just order a pathogen and distribute it? Well, I guess um, I, I as of now, I wouldn't be comfortable with that world, I guess. Um, yeah, we would need to develop some technology probably such that either the scanning uh, at the DNA synthesizers happens uh, with m a much, much lower um, false positive in terms of safe rate, um, or we need to have protections just like within each place where you would distribute a pathogen that it's, it's not going to just spread. But that's why I think the order of acceleration of technologies matters to me. So if we were to have, just imagine we had not vaccines, but some incredible air refreshing system plus like um, surface cleaning, like uh, sterilizing systems, as well as um, uh, some like antivirals and maybe even vaccines against pretty much any pathogen that could exist. Right. If, if we just had the technology in dream world um, at that point, maybe actually everyone having control, uh, everyone having access to this new pathogen wouldn't be so dangerous anymore. Right. And we would be yeah. totally fine with everyone having it because the expected fatal like death rate of this yeah. is just very, very low next to zero. Yeah. Um, that's why I'm more in favor of can we accelerate those technologies that like protect us first rather than the ones that just broadly allow all things and we'll see whether they create more harm or more good yeah that's a very good point that's a very good point and but um so when talking about that though um igor i it seems to me that the world is going to be divided more or less in two camps maybe you have the smart world in which um you know people are at, at the very minimum they're following they're following both paths for me it's or what you're going to have is, okay, maybe I'm going to be biased here, but I wouldn't be surprised that right now, maybe, um, well, actually, maybe I might, because what you're talking about, I wouldn't be surprised that um, at least smart nations should each one of them be working on both at the same time, because 
we cannot, uh, for example, we can't control, and we should never be controlling what other people do. Uh, we can't control what China does or Russia is doing or whatever. And I, I'm, I can hear the point of view of people saying, "Hey, um, I hear your point of uh, let's maybe decelerate until we have developed the other, you know, like the protective, the protective gear." But mm -hmm. um, it seems to me like we can't really rely on that. It would be very dangerous to say, let us uh, accelerate the protective gear. Once we have that, then it's okay to let, to let um, you know, the, the, the weapons or the, the bad ways it could be used. We can, you know, we can let, let deploy that. So what I'm trying to say is I don't, I don't, um, I feel like we were forced in a way to have to do both. I think um, no, <laughs> or I see you smiling. No, it, it does. It does feel that way. I mean, the, there are many incentives forcing us to do that, right? Like there's economic incentives because, um, yeah, developing more capabilities usually allows it to be used in many, in many, many good ways. Like again, like most of the stuff that AI is right now being implemented for is fantastic, and I want more of it. Right. Like I want the future where AI runs our entire economy. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be great. It's going to be a world of abundance. Like that's. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, I absolutely want that to happen. I just don't care as, like, I care more about whether we get there at all than whether it happens in 15 years rather than in 20 years. To me, that's, I would rather have it happen in 20 years with a higher likelihood of it happening than in 15 years with a lower likelihood. Right. Um, I think that's maybe a good summary of where uh, some of the people in AI safety stand versus some of the people in EX stand. Mm. But yeah, a lot of incentives that push us there. Uh, economic ones, then there is also just competition with other nations. But I think that developing the defensive technologies is beneficial for everyone as well. Uh, okay. So I would like to see more more competition around that. Yeah. And then whether you, you mentioned smart nations, I'm I'm kind of not seeing that much that, that many smarts from that many nations. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I we were attempting to get um, like pretty good spending for biosafety through um, in the in the US as part of the infrastructure bill in 2021 mm -hmm. and it was cut so much from like 60 billion to two and a half two billion in the end mm -hmm. and that was uh, the initial 60 billion included a lot of the things that I was talking about about early detection of uh, pandemic potential pathogens as well as kind of the uh, systems that would be then in place to sterilize and uh, the general areas that people uh, find themselves in, as well as uh, to create countermeasures like vaccines and antivirals. And a lot of that was cut. And it was cut um, during COVID, <laughs> during a time when the US lost about $10 trillion to to that disease and its response, like not only to the disease, right? But it was that response. the response was so poorly handled that yeah. um, it, it created a lot of economic damage as well. Right. So if you then run through the numbers, they basically like could, uh, so how often does a pandemic occur? Um, the last one of that magnitude was about a hundred years ago, given more humans and more labs that exist and labs remain leaky. Maybe instead of once in a hundred years, it will go down towards one in ten. So call it like three, three times in a hundred years or so. And the cost is ten trillion. Probably it's going to go up. But if it's a ten trillion cost, then it's basically a three hundred billion per year cost that it has if it occurs three times per hundred years. And can you, by spending thirty billion per year, reduce that likelihood of its occurrence by ten percent? And the answer is clearly yes. Like just looking at what has been attempted so far in addressing it and what has not been attempted, it's it's clearly yes that you can reduce it by 10% and much more. And actually the proposal wasn't for 30 billion. The proposal was for um, five to 10 billion per year, basically an additional spend. And it sounds like a lot of money and it obviously is, but uh, I think we're also looking at those numbers often a bit poorly. Like it would be probably better to discuss uh, the government spending in kind of a per capita basis. So we have like 300 million people, three, 10 billion spent would be about $300 per person. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and then, or another way to discuss it would be by looking at like what percentage of the total government spending does it make up? And the total government spending, I think, is about five trillion, right? Mm -hmm. So um, even so, ten billion per year is 0.2 percent of it. Should the U.S. government be spending 0.2 percent of its budget on um, improving its uh, capabilities to address potential future pandemics? Yeah. Yes. Yep. <laughs> I think pretty clearly. Yeah. It's pretty. It's a. It's a pretty um, easy. Uh, you know. At least to me, it seems like very easy. So, when Igor, when I'm listening to you, when I listen to you, then what I'm feeling, the more I listen to you talk about this, and the more I'm wondering if maybe a third way, a third very clear way, uh, needs to exist. Because as you know, people like me, I'm very much uh, EA because you know uh, because of a big focus of EA on global poverty. Uh, it's just it's just not acceptable to me that we live in in the 21st century that some people are living still in poverty. It's just not acceptable. I just want to be done with that. And um, I happen to come from the continent that has you know so but is the poorest in the world. So you can understand my focus on 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 that. And you know, at the end of the day, there's only 24 hours in a day, and there's only so many resources. So, folks like me, that's more where I'm focused on. But at the same time, I think you and I were talking about that. I think it's important that going back to this concept of a smart community, a smart community, you have people working on different problems. Uh, we don't put all of our eggs in one basket, right? So, me, I'm very clear that my focus is on the more or less what uh, EA focuses on, although. I go about it more in terms of addressing it, uh, the systemic nature of poverty. And that's why mm -hmm. you know, with startup cities and all of that, and I'll ask you what you think of that. But so for someone like me, the, 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 the goal of EA is very clear. That's pretty much where I am, except I don't go about it the right, the same way. Then uh, facing off, or they think they face off, is the EAC, wor the EAC world. Then it seems to me from what I'm hearing you say, and uh, I feel like, you know, I've been, the, 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 the reality seems to speak on behalf of what seems to agree with you. It seems to me that for them, it's just like, let's accelerate forward. Um, they're not really wondering about what are they going to fall on at the end of the day. They're, they, 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 they sound like, oh, we're, we're going to land on good territory. You're saying, hey, guys, it could go either way. And I, and I agree with you. Uh, but then I don't think it's going to change much. So I think what there's a third way that's needed in here. So you have global poverty, all of that is being taken care of, human suffering, all of that, and animal suffering. Then um, you have the EAC world racing towards a future that they're not bothering to know if it's going to be good for them in the end or not. I think we need a third way <laughs> that's solely focused and we should not expect or wait for the government to lead the way because as we, you and I know, uh, but the third way needs to, needs to be born. Um, maybe it exists already and I just don't know, but the third way needs to be, needs to be there and solely focused on, we are going to be thinking, and I know, and I know that's in a way what you focus on, Igor, you're, 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 you're devoting your life to working on existential risks. Um, so, but it would be nice that, um, we have folk that you are thinking about those problems, but then the people who are working on mitigating that, do we have, do, do they have a, is there such a group that is working the same way the, um, these guys are racing towards, you know, with mm -hmm. AI control? Do we have another group that's working towards, hey, if uh, a bio risk emerges tomorrow or AI goes rogue or crazy, uh, do we have a group working just on that, on like protections, the protection gear? Yeah, I mean, there are many separate and individual groups working on this areas. On, or roughly on these areas. I think if, I don't know, would you have counted EA as one of those groups? Um, I think EA as a kind of idea or like as a, is probably on pause. I think they need to prove themselves to, um, to do good things over a number of years prior to it being a, <laughs> um, aspirational group to be a part of again. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are, there are, I don't know whether we need um, a country or a specific group to focus on um, this kind of like protective gear. I think uh, a lot of people feel currently inspired to develop AI technologies in the right way. Uh, there are a number of people who work on uh, biosafety and biosecurity. 
And probably the amount of people in those areas is still too small, though, by quite a bit. So usually the people working on capability improvements are still quite a bit higher. And there is arguably quite a bit of overlap between the two. But I think that uh, doesn't always work out that way. So, yeah. Uh, to the question whether I think, for, by the way, on the uh, kind of like as a pro on the EX side, I think they do have a very strong belief that um, us just racing ahead with max speed is the. They do believe that this is the most likely the mo the way to most likely create a good outcome. I disagree with that, but I think that, that is their assumption. And as part of their assumption, they probably also believe that um, having more prosperity globally is also that which has lifted historically a lot of people out of poverty, right? Um, because once everything becomes cheaper, now also the poor people can afford it and that, 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 that could uh, trickle through basically. Yeah. That said, I think that in many ways it's um, kind of an over-reliance and uh, it's ascribing too much um, too much benevolence and uh, ability to markets. Markets just have, while I think they're great and they should be used for whenever they can, um, they do have externalities and they also don't have a good way to price someone who can who has neither capital nor can contribute with their labor now they are kind of outside of markets like they, they can't participate in markets if they don't have either right and that and that applies to a number of people right. um, so markets aren't great at taking care of that mm -hmm. um, my general my general belief was by the way with philanthropy as well that um, you should use markets where wherever you can and uh, where markets fail is where the government is meant to jump in. Generally, that's where they may raise taxes to create social welfare because it hasn't, they haven't been addressed sufficiently well. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and when governments also fail or because they have missed something, that's where I see philanthropy's job to be, to jump in and address those issues. Right. right. So in terms of like which groups exist, I think the groups that address those questions that we discussed, can also come out of all three of those uh, pillars. Like they can, they they exist within um, for-profit businesses. There are groups within governments that are of high quality, that include high quality people that really care and do good work. And then there are also nonprofit organizations that, um, I don't know, just advocate for good things or even do research on, on um, some, some of the things that I mentioned around, for example, um, the scanner uh, to to identify a pathogens that shouldn't be ordered from a DNA synthesizer. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you think we need a like one umbrella organization of it all? I yeah. do agree that it has the issue then that <laughs> yeah. uh, now we're centralizing it again. I don't. I, yeah. I don't think we necessarily need that. Well, the reason, the only reason why I bring up. Um, Maybe it's not an organization. Maybe it doesn't have to be an organization. But, you know, you talked about the numbers. You talked about the fact that, uh, you know, it's nowhere, these initiatives are nowhere being funded the way they should be funded. And I, I was speaking more from that standpoint. You know what I mean? So, because it's getting very clear to me that, uh, um, again, these guys who are racing towards the future, uh, betting that they're going to land on, on, on good standing, fine. I would like to believe that too, but I'm all about, you know, uh, you know, trust but verify so in case in case we don't end up where their optimistic view leads us to i think it would be so stupid for us not to be thinking about you know the uh, an, uh the protective gear again so but the way i'm totally sure agree like there is a sorry i just want to add to that I, I i think there is a very important difference between optimism and blind optimism right. and that i feel like is not uh, often struck right by right. Uh, EX and many of many, many of the folks around it, right, um, right. So that's why yeah. I feel like if, 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 to me, I, I said a group, but again, it doesn't have to be a group. But I want to feel like there is a very intentional effort, very well funded as well. Um, it can be for for profit, not for profit, hybrid. I don't care. I just want to mm -hmm. know that we have enough brains, you know, focusing focusing on the protective gear. 
Seriously, <laughs> we may never need uh, it. I would rather build it and never need it. Uh, especially that, you know, I mean, it, it just, it, to me, it's a no brainer. So I am worried if I, if I'm sitting here and feeling that we're, the no, the, the protective gear is just being worked on as we go and little group here, little group there, there, you know what I mean? So that's more what I was saying. So maybe this is not a group that mm -hmm. we did or anything like that, but I just want to know that there's an intentional uh, focus on that and very serious and not a, a buy a buy a buy product or a buy or, or an afterthought or like a, oh and uh, you know some of us uh -uh. it needs to have almost the same focus if not even more than those working on you know just racing forward uh yeah i agree i'd also like for there to be sufficient i but i i don't think there presently is sufficient focus on it um, but what is what is sufficient? There are people working on it. Um, not everyone is. So there is a lot of space in between those two numbers, <laughs> between someone working on it and everyone working on just the, say, mechanistic interpretability part of um, uh, AI systems uh, prior to then developing them further. So I, I, I don't know, to be honest. I think that uh, we would definitely benefit from more people focusing on the protective gear. Um, it's harder to motivate people. There's less money in working on protective stuff than it is on uh, working on kind of capability increasing stuff. Um, so that's a bit of a downside. But even that, Igor, sorry to interrupt, but even that is so stupid to me. That way of thinking is so stupid to me. Um, I think there, should, there would be a lot of value in uh, if people were to say, oh, if there is this disease or this bio risk, you know, goes around for us to know that, oh, well, we have a vaccine for that or we have whatever it is that we're going to have for that. It's equal value. And I, I totally agree. I mean, technically, it technically you should if you develop a company uh, or a for profit business, then there is an amount of value that you create and then uh, your the percentage of the value that your business can capture is kind of like the total value of the business that you've created. So you are interested in both creating more value for the world and two, yeah. capturing a higher percentage of the value that you've created. Um, so technically, if it is true that the protective gear uh, provides a lot of value, then there should also be uh, a lot of potential value to be captured. Unfortunately, the type of value that protection creates is not often the type of value that people are willing to pay for a lot, not for the reason that it's not valuable to them, but more for the reasons I think that people round a 5% risk mentally down to zero yeah. pretty frequently. Yeah. And right. people don't price things that are bads in 20 years as much as they price them today. Right. There's like um, fairly reasonable as well, but still um, discount on, on, on those things. And then, yeah, so it ends up being the case that people just don't pay much for avoiding a 1% very bad thing per year. It's people yeah. do that, I suppose, with their houses, but, and they're willing to do that with, with nutrition if they can afford it. Mm -hmm. uh, then they improve their nutrition usually, which is another example of this, mm -hmm. but like how much are people willing to pay for the avoidance of nuclear war? That's right. It's it's we we don't yet have a system for it. We kind of rely on governments to take care of that and just don't think about it. Yeah. I mean, technically, the willingness, the total amount of willingness, if it was possible to reduce the risk of nuclear war from one of the wars that is happening right now by ten percent, um, the like the, <laughs> the total amount of value created from actually reducing it by ten percent. Uh, would be enormous, right? It would be a billion to 10 billion people having prospectively a much better life, better life. Uh, as, as an, an expectation. Mm -hmm. But somehow, despite that being something that is potentially achievable, there is no business around it. And I think it's because um, one, people uh, are unsure how they could like solve it with a business. Mm -hmm. And two... But that shouldn't be standing in the way. You could, you should still have like people at least trying it out with a startup mindset where you can fail while you attempt it. Doesn't yeah. mean that you succeed, right? But right, right. the total addressable market though is theoretically large, but practically small because I don't know, people are not going to pay much for nuclear war insurance. 
It seems like too crazy. It's, I, I'm giving yeah. you nuclear war insurance, my God. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, <laughs> you want to pay me $100 a year for um, funding something? I mean, in effect, that's what you do if you donate to a nuclear war uh, reduction organizations that yeah. do policy work. That's true. For that's example. True. That's true. Well, that's another way to think about it, maybe. So, um, Igor, on the topic of um, people having, you know, thinking outside of the box a little bit, I know you've been following, or at least we talked about the startup cities. Uh, these are next generation economic zones with their own law and governance, you know, for poor countries to escape what made them poor in the first place for the most part, which is terrible business environments and investors not wanting to go there. Do you, what are you, what, what's your take on those, on those, um, on those initiatives? Um, how, where do you, by now, what, what are your thoughts about them? About the hmm. I mean, I, it's, it's not an area I know, uh, it's not an area I know a lot about. It's mm -hmm. one where you know much more about than me. Mm -hmm. um, just in general, I am very favorable of things that allow experimentation mm -hmm. um, and where we can learn from experiments and, uh, well, basically experimentation plus also the ability to incorporate the feedback afterwards yeah. um, in the next iteration of something. Right. And uh, someone will now point out that I was speaking for control before, which is a reduction of experimentation, but it's not the case. I'm still very much for experimentation. It's just that if the experiment can kill you, then can kill everyone, then maybe you should yeah. Yeah. have slightly higher safety That's requirements right. for that particular experiment. Mm -hmm. um, but startup cities don't seem to be the type of experiment that kills everybody. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great experiment, <laughs> a way to experiment on different governance structures mm -hmm. and legal structures that mm -hmm. uh, then afterwards uh, nations or city states or other areas, economic zones or other yeah, different structures can look at uh, to inform themselves. Mm -hmm. I think you kind of have to you do have to show that it works. Yeah. Um, so it's, I, I'm excited that it's, it's, it's happening and uh, yeah, I'm happy to see they're working on it. Well, we'll keep you posted. Um, we'll keep you posted on that. And um, uh, co co correlated to, to that, you know, these, these countries that need these sort of cities that really, because they happen to be poor, they also happen to be nations um, from where a lot of the immigrants are coming from. You know, the, the immigrants that, uh, the type of immigrants that right now the U S is fighting over, you know, uh, the type of immigrants where we're like thinking, do we build walls or do we have sanctuary cities? <laughs> you know, uh, and I know you have a very, um, very sober take on this whole immigration thing, uh, Igor. Please share. Yeah, so on immigration, I think uh, basically in the somewhat near future, uh, we will be all with that. I mean, like all of our nations will probably be fighting for immigrants. Uh, in the way of ec economically fighting to to have some, the Western countries, uh, the developed Western countries, all have uh, uh, fertility rates under um, uh, under two point one. So they are all in declining populations. If you didn't have immigration, and it's not only that they're currently reducing. If you look at the population pyramids of um, pretty much all Western countries they are also all particularly wide kind of right after the people that were born after the second world war. So the baby boomers and a little bit afterwards, mm -hmm. um, what, and the current age of them is, uh, in the sixties and mid sixties. So that whole very wide section of population pyramids is going to become, uh, not contributing to, um, on a, in, in through labor, pretty soon and they're moving from contributors to dependents yeah. uh, on the social welfare structures within the uh, within the system. And the overall ratio has already been going more and more because we're also now living longer, right? The um, uh, life expectancy has been going up basically in all Western, Western countries, uh, except for the US, unfortunately, for like the last two, three years, it hasn't, which is a massive tragedy. Um, but in either case, the life expectancy goes up overall. I'm sure the U.S. will recover as well, while the um, with the, which also creates a, an even higher burden of dependence on the contributors. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at that together, then 
you will pretty soon not be able to kind of just have these higher and higher social welfare demands that the uh, Western countries aim to have, uh, aim to supply. So then the question is, where do you get all of the contributors from if they can't come from the country? I think one, we will have see a shift towards more fertility uh, favorable policies. Um, many countries have tried, but it's been very hard so far. Uh, and given that that is also has quite of a lag, right? Like if you have a fertility policy now, you have a new baby in a year, maybe 10 new babies in, in a year, mm -hmm. uh, until they become contributors to the economy, it usually takes 20 years. Mm -hmm. So it's very slow. So I think in five to 10 years, when all of these people shift there, um, most countries will realize that their only way to uh, improve the contributor to dependency ratio will be by allowing more immigrants in. Mm -hmm. And right now we are in this position of, privilege where we are kind of like talking about which skill cutoff we would like to have such that we would allow immigrants in. And we're at this point where at least high skill, high skill immigration is agreed upon yeah. by in the U S the left and the right, that it should be allowed in. Yeah. But for one, we still don't allow all high skill immigration in the total amount of um, I think masters plus, uh, applicants was something like 300,000 in the US and I think only 80,000 or so were let, let in. Um, it's worth double checking if someone wants to think, but the ratio is left, roughly right, surely. Mm -hmm. um, so for one, we don't even allow all the high school immigration in. And then uh, the mistake reading it's actually in the back somewhere, like Brian Kaplan's uh, work on uh, open borders, even though I think he goes a bit far and misassumes the backlash that happens when you actually have fully open borders. Mm -hmm. um, but the point that he makes, which is um, from looking into it, like pretty accurate is that even if you have a, um, an initially barely net contributing immigrant, their children usually become yeah. already contributors, right? right? So if you consider that on a longer time scale, which governments, unfortunately, Western governments very rarely do, mm -hmm. then you could go much further down in skill uh, while still having a net beneficial uh, immigration line that you're getting into your country. Mm. And yeah, I think the U.S. is messing up incredibly, incredibly hard on this because right now all of the immigrants want to, like so many immigrants want to come here. Uh, I came here as an immigrant. Same here. Uh, many, Same here. Yeah. And I'm very happy about it. <laughs> I, I would like to stay here, but it was pain to do it, right? Yep. Uh, and uh, it's a pain for many others. And many people are being just not let in at the border. India's immigrants have to wait like a thousand days plus, I think, to even like have their application letters be read and or to get an appointment rather. Right. And it is a, such a privileged position that the U S is in right now where the world's immigrants mainly want to go here yes. and they're sending them away. And I think in five to 10 years, all countries will be competing to get immigrants. So then you will have to pay potentially to get them by giving them more beneficial policies. And it's just such a financial and through that just general economic and welfare waste that is currently happening here. Yeah, that's very well said, very well said. And, but as and you I, I really recommend to the listener just looking at the population pyramids of like just select a bunch of countries and look at them. Uh, it, 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 it's just pretty clear that uh, we will be in a much higher uh, dependent to uh, contributor ratio somewhat soon. The alternative solution that could exist like the if if AI and robotics progresses continuously at the speed as it is right now, then maybe we will be saved by robotics and AI kind of um, just substituting a lot of the labor that is currently being done by humans. And then we will have those contributors uh, via machines. But for one, I hope that we have set up our kind of uh, system such that uh, it doesn't get concentrated even more than it is presently to only like a few people where those benefits accrue, um, but is a bit further distributed. And uh, yeah, also it might not happen. Like I do think for, that it will probably happen that we will get uh, robotics and AI improvements continuously over the next few years. But there are a lot of reasons why it might just plateau for a while. Uh, and then we will be in this very 
negative situation on the basis of having had fertility rates that are low. And then Nigeria, Niger, they have high fertility rates. Like we'll need, like everyone will want those immigrants, I think, soon enough. Yeah, yeah. No, they will. And then uh, some, and then me, I'm sitting there being like, well, but we also need to develop our country. So, <laughs> so because, and so if I have anything to do with that, if I have anything to do with the current situation, if our startup cities work the way I know they're going to work, then it means what you're describing, Igor, is going to be even worse because if our people all of a sudden have no reason to want to go somewhere else, then it reduces even the pool even further. And then, like you were saying, all the problems go higher up. So I do think it's going to be an interesting, um, you know, uh, five, 10 years ahead, 15 years ahead for for the world when it comes to immigration and how population distributes itself. Mm. Because like I said, again, you know, people like me, we're going to be over there working, working our butts off so that, um, you know, our nations get to be developed. And But if they get developed, it means less people are going to want to flock, you know, to the Western mm. world. Um, and so, yeah, so I think um, I think there's a lot of good thinking to do here. But, um, yeah. I, but yeah, I wonder what, what's going to happen with further brain drain from some of the nations. I mean, that's it's it's been historically bad for a number of countries, right? Yeah. And um, I think yeah. this could occur potentially here too. Yeah. Um, I hope that if like the brain drain that often happened, if you look at Russia or Iran, for example, then that also happened because the current government in place was such that the people didn't want to come back to the country, um, right? And people left often for political reasons outside of just uh, hoping to live a kind of richer, better life uh, with more opportunities. Um, Whereas if you don't have this political issue, then I I would imagine that the number of people that come back and now want to improve their home uh, is is probably larger. I don't know whether that's sufficient, though, and I think that that's certainly going to be an issue to figure out as well later. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a factor. How how big it's going to be, I don't know yet. It depends. I think some countries, like countries like mine, where it's not so much about violence or anything like that, that's the reason why people are leaving us. Most of our mm-hmm. most most people, ninety nine point nine percent of people leaving Senegal, it's, deco- it's due to poverty. If tomorrow we make mm-hmm. the conditions better, and you know, it's as um, it's as great to live in Senegal as it is uh, the, the the levels of material, um, the the level of um, you know material comfort that we people enjoy in New York or whatever and better if we had it back home i i would probably argue that um 80% of people would be stay would be staying home mm. it's, it's that less people yeah. who are going to be going anywhere so or if you don't have the or if you don't have the comfort but you have um but the policies there are, are such that an entrepreneur can go there and has the uh, things that they can actually stand a good chance of building wealth in the yeah, country, right? Exactly. Like often that's also an issue there, like exactly. trust exactly. issues, exactly. Skill issues, etc. Exactly. I mean, yeah. and, the, and the, the other one that you're not think, we're not talking about right now, and it, this is another one in terms of reducing the pool. I mean, I don't have empirical data, but I'm just going by what uh, I see around me which I have yet to, to meet, um, the only diaspora that I have met who will with a straight face tell you we're never going back home is in a way the diaspora that has turned their back on their country because it's so bad. Like I have friends from Zimbabwe, for example, who by mm-hmm. now have completely given any hope. They just don't believe it's ever going to happen. But the truth mm. is the diaspora right now around the world, at least I look at the African diaspora, <laughs> the minute things get better back home or like you said, they see this window and, you know, they realize, oh, you mean I can go back home and I can invest in my country? There again, I, I don't have empirical data, but what I'm seeing around me is 80% of people would not even spend one more day in the US or in Europe. We're gone. Mm. So mm. that's another thing as well. And again, yeah, that's that, that's hopeful mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's why I think it would be good for America at least to hear you out because, uh, I think, um, you know, in all of this noise, uh, we're not hearing, again, this very, you know, measured way that you just talked about it. Um, everybody's like, let's build the center cities or let's do this. But, you know, you're, you're making so much sense. So this... Um, Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we funded um, from the Musk Foundation um, uh, some work on uh, in- increased fertility rates. And I think that that is a thing that could... 
that 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 could um, help with some of the ensuing issues in the Western world. That said, the the lag time of it is just so high. Uh, we will we'll just not avoid um, having to increase or broaden our immigration guidelines as well. That's. Um, Yeah, you're very right. But but at the same time, I feel like it should be worked on, though, because, um, you know, I guess, you know, you and I, we talked about that as well. But, uh, you know, there's this fear out there by some people that they feel they're in the process of being replaced, you know. Mm. And at the end of the day, demographic is everything. You know, if some people are not reproducing, but others are, well, it just... It's not. It's no. It's no surprise who is going to be around in a few years, and whatever their mm -hmm. culture is is going to be what's going to be the lay of the land. Whatever their religion is, and it's just it's just normal. If you don't reproduce, but we, you know, you get it. So there, though, in terms of a, uh, natality um, uh, policies, that I definitely feel like uh, Western nations should be thinking about some more. Also, the private sector should be thinking more about what can they do in order to make it uh, make it easier for women to also have children without but there's one there's one thing there that i i see that um i don't hear people talk about often uh, hmm. it's the crisis of love the crisis of romantic love i fe i feel hmm. like in the western world um people are more and more lonely there's a lot of loneliness it, it's 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 baffles me to see that young people i mean 18 16 17 18 have to go on dating sites in order to meet other people and it's unbelievable and uh, um so I, i i i i think we don't also we don't talk enough about that i don't know if it's something that you have seen or you've read about or you're suspecting or not but i do feel like there's a crisis of love because <laughs> you know to make those children in a way Nobody wants to be mm. alone, right? If if they if if they have a choice. Now I know sometimes you have to, but uh, yeah. So there is. Do you do you see that? And I, I mean, I, I, I bring personally, I was love live. So I know you and Liv have really really good love. You know, good strong love. So I'm sure you won't mind talking about love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, personally, I uh, started just dating Liv as uh, I, at the time when others started using Tinder and, uh, or, or other apps, I don't know which one it was at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of avoided that, that whole part of uh, experience, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, so I, I, I have an experience that I was, I was very lucky, like lives in my relationship is really easy. We've now been together for 10 years. Uh, it just it just fits very well. I, I yeah, I, I really was just very lucky. I don't I don't know. At the same time, yeah, you do see in uh, as you said, like in many Western countries, you do see more and more teenagers remaining single, and uh, the rate of yeah partnerships is going down. The rate of, uh, or rather, the age at which point people have sex for the first time is going up. The length of time that, like, especially young men don't have sex, remain goes becomes longer and longer at a higher and higher ratio. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's pretty crazy. It seems like there is there's definitely something going on worth worth figuring out there. I'm I'm personally not too familiar with that aspect of it, mm -hmm. um, but it seems seems quite important. Yeah. That's it, though. On the um, other part that you mentioned, that it should be made easier for the woman to have children, I kind of, I, I think that's one of the important things to figure out around um, uh, ways to increase fertility rates. Yeah. Like historically, what, what what we know so far is that uh, fertility rates have come down when female education has gone up, yeah. and when wealth of a country has gone up, right? right. And um, increasing fertility rates by inverting those two factors is not a good solution. We don't want to reduce female education and reduce the uh, wealth of the country, right? Just, do not touch our <laughs> We're not questioning that. <laughs> no, so that doesn't work. But then the question is, why do those factors um, reduce fertility rates? And I think um, it is, uh, one, one can look at uh, the opportunities that uh, women have or from like from an economic sense simply if if you uh if the country becomes wealthier then the amount of stuff that you can do with your time increases usually right the opportunities that you have and similarly if education becomes available then now you have this new whole pursuit that you can do as well as 
uh, afterwards you now want to go into work. So the opportunity cost for having children just grows. So that's why I think what probably needs to be done is a reduction of that ratio of the cost benefit mm -hmm. uh, for a woman while having a child. And uh, <laughs> doing it by reducing the benefits is kind of the like evil person <laughs> solution to it. The better solution to it is by uh, reducing the costs and increasing the benefits, right? Mm -hmm. And reducing the cost could be done by, Uh, for example, the snoo that many of my friends use, the one that like rocks your baby uh, or yes. back and forth. And like through that, like they sleep easier. It already saves women, like it, it ranges, but like between half an hour to an hour maybe of the day. Mm -hmm. So that reduces the cost a little bit. Um, and then there, the, one could see many other things uh, being done there. Uh, some of them sound a bit icky because they involve technology in ways that people wouldn't want to involve it, but maybe something like very high quality um, cult cultivated breast milk or something where uh, we, we see that currently with cultivated meat, right? Where you take uh, cells of uh, chicken muscle mm -hmm. and out of that, you can then grow um, uh, more chicken muscle without actually needing an animal at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you can reproduce breast milk as well in a higher quality level than what is currently exists. Of course, we wouldn't want to experiment on it. That's why in part it's hard to do. No one wants to ex have their child be one of the first um, like experimentations sure. of such a procedure uh, or of, of, of such a product. So that's going to be hard. But one could see further things. One, to reduce the cost of mm -hmm. having the child, maybe um, more nanny services at a cheaper rate. There are a lot of Older women that currently that stopped working, maybe some of them would like to also assist with uh, helping children. Um, this is me really picking something out of the air, though. So uh, that's oh, a bit. No, you're onto something. Uh, but and then the other thing I think that's also missing is like, and that's what's been tried as well. Is and that's usually not a technological solution, but is the question around you can also increase the benefits, and increase benefits is what's basically being tried by the government with. Um, increasing uh, financial uh, support for having children, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that has been surprisingly unsuccessful. Many countries that increase financial support kind of drop back in fertility rates. I think it's only Czechia that managed to go up from like 1.2 to 1.7 uh, women per uh, ch children per woman. So, but you could have uh, like, I think there could be also a cultural shift towards it so like a benefit is also something like respect and appreciation yes. is also a benefit yes. right yes. and yes. just having a culture that yes. values motherhood and like puts it i think fortunately naturally that will happen at the point when it's just so rare to see a mother then people are gonna be surprised how someone can be a mother but i think that's a bit late I think um, I, I'd be in favor of creating, I don't know, movies, et cetera, that just talk positively about about motherhood. I've, I've, um, and then, mm -hmm. yeah. No, go ahead. I wanted to mention one more thing on the uh, decreasing costs. The other part that could be made in the, like, again, having the frame of decreased costs, increased benefits is it's very normal that women right now want to... Uh, and people in general, <laughs> just people want to have an education and then work and kind of build their own path in life. Right. Yeah. And unfortunately it, it's very sad that um, for uh, people who want to give birth later, this, they only have until the age of depends, but like 40, 45 to, to do that usually. And that is the time when education, especially if you're going to med school lasts until you're 30, Yeah. If you're doing something else, maybe 22 to 25, depends on how fast you are. Uh, and then you want to work for a few years. So if we can push the age, uh, how long uh, people can give birth, how long women can like have children to a bit further, which you can do with IVF mm -hmm. or other technologies. And if you can maybe reduce <laughs> the amount of years you have to spend in education, mm -hmm. I'm not sure we need to be in school until 30. I'm, I agree with you on that. <laughs> I agree with you on that. Yeah, yeah that would also help.
No, I mean, Igor, you're making a very good point because uh, on the education part, I actually think we're going to get there because what I'm seeing happening um, in Alt-Ed, you know, um, is very, very uh, encouraging because we're going more for this concept of lifelong learner. So this idea that if you're doing it right, you should be learning your whole life. So really, all you should be learning in school is to learn how, I mean, all you should be learning is learn how to learn. And so which means you should not be somewhere unless you're like in some very pointy scientific you know fields where it doesn't right. make sense to be in the lab and things like that but everything else you should be a lifelong learner and the sooner you get you get launched in life the better it is so i do think that cultural shift and also education is is, is a is changing so that i do believe that's going to happen in our lifetime i'm seeing it already yeah i hope so yeah I'm seeing sure. it, yeah with the homeschooled kids and then the other thing when you were talking about culture the culture having to go back and uh re-celebrate uh, um you know put a new status on on women with children and all of that to me, that's a big one where, along along with the uh, technological advances that you discussed, that's the one I'm really hoping we get to see. But then when I see where feminism, crazy feminism 3.0, you see, I blame them for a lot of problems. I blame those women, for, those feminists for a lot of problems. Because, you know, nowadays you even have some women who are telling you flat out, look, I don't care that I went to Harvard. And I have friends like that. Mm -hmm. I don't care that I went to Harvard and I don't care that I went to Yale. I don't care. I want to raise a family and I'm perfectly fine staying at home, raising my family, my husband being the breadwinner, leave me alone. That's what makes me happy. You have whole Instagram, you know, like feeds like that. There's a whole, but you know what? They get trashed and dumped on by this feminist 3.0 who for them, that's the most horrible thing you can, you can hear. It's almost like, oh, what, what do you mean? We fought for you to have all of this independence and this is what you do with it. You just ruin it like this. So that's a little battle that you have behind the scene. Uh, going totally. and, I, and I sure hope our side, I call myself an anti-feminist feminist and I, I told Liv already. <laughs> I like it. That. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully yeah. we're going to win, you know, because this is ridiculous. Yeah. Leave us alone. Give us, you, you said you fought for us to have a choice. Great. We have a choice now and let us do with, with that choice, what we want, but clearly they're not agreeing, but hopefully. yeah. Also, many of them didn't in fact fight. They came into, uh, the world, which feminism 1.0 and 2.0 has created for them to, to a large part. And now they're kind of, I don't know. Yeah. Just they, they are in fact not in the same situation of as many plights as the people prior to them were. And sometimes in my belief, at least are pushing totally in the wrong direction. Actually, um, Brian Kaplan again has a book. I don't know if you've read it. I think it's called why I'm not a feminist. Or, oh yeah, or yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's a great, yeah, book. where he, yeah, yeah. he writes a letter to his, it starts with him writing a letter to his daughter explaining, um, yeah, <laughs> the issues around feminism that he sees. No, that's why you can relate. Anti-feminist feminist, that's me. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, Brian is just <laughs> no, for sure. For sure. Are, you getting, are you getting some hate for that? I would imagine. Oh, so. you have no idea. You have no idea. And you know, the one that pisses them off the most is I like to say, in my home, in our household, my husband is king and I am his beloved queen. They have a problem mm -hmm. with the king part. It's just like, how dare you? What are you thinking? You know? <laughs> so you want to you give him a heart attack? Say stuff like that. And it's just going <laughs> to... The button was pushed and they go, wow. So anyway. <laughs> well, uh, Igor, this has been a really, really great conversation. Uh, is there anything that um, we we did not go into that you wanted, that you wanted to say something about? Or... Um, no, we touched on a, on a bunch of things. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's the last thing. I, I do really think there is, yeah, as uh, kind of a general theme of what we talked about is, hey, there is this one approach to solving something and there is also this other approach to solving it, right? And what often happens is just people get so tribal about either approach and make it out to be as if it was this either or situation where like in most cases it is yeah it, it it is not the case that there is only the one or the other i mean it's classic false dichotomy that has been created around acceleration about centralization etc mm -hmm. um i think kind of this tribal thing that we've gotten to is is uh, really painful but uh others um have said i imagine already plenty about it so <laughs> that's no, another conversation well, but believe it or not, though, you, you make such a good point about it. Um, so this, this for me, also, I learned a lot, actually, because um, 
I did not, I did not, um, yeah, I, I learned a lot. There is definitely some subtleties in there that I did not catch on before we talked. Mm. I want to recommend a book maybe then uh, on that topic is uh, Tim Urban's What's Our Problem, um, where he kind of like one of the things that he developed there is, I mean, it's, it's, it's an old thought that he just describes better than others have done before him. Um, but that there you can, one axis is what you think, and it may be left or right, or this side of the issue versus that side of the issue. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, other axis, the Y axis is uh, how you got there. Mm -hmm. And the how you got there is you've approached it as a like, search for truth or you've approached it as a fan of one opinion or you've approached it as a lawyer who is fighting for this one opinion really really hard but in the end truth still like he's they still um agree to the rules kind of and to truth or you approach it as a zealot where it's just totally absolutist there is only this one view to be had and everyone with an opposing view uh needs to be called and yeah in in various ways uh just like pushed away and Yeah, the question often to ask is, I think, about people defending, even on your own side of any issue. Um, I think the people who are zealots about that one topic that you care about are often, I think, still destructive overall to to your side even, because most often any issue you care about is only kind of a means to achieving the ends of better life for your family or for civilization or whatever it is that your actual ends are. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think we should be more careful of the extreme zealots, even when they're on our side. And this is why I enjoy speaking with you, uh, Igor, because um, you're very good at uh, the yes. And uh, you know, which is very critical. I think it's important to be yes. And, and uh, that's pretty much, we, we don't have enough people thinking this way. And I, I do think it's people like that who are going to help us get out of this mess right now. So, because both sides, are so. their heels. yeah, no, I, I really appreciate you because even I catch myself being one of the zealots sometimes on some things and it's mm -hmm. always good to be reminded, yeah. you know, uh, uh, but, but exactly, actually you make the right point. Like we, we all are sometimes zealous about something, right? It, it mustn't mean that you're a bad person because you're zealous about some opinion. It's like, well, I, I don't know what life you've lived and what led you to mm -hmm. having these extreme kind of yeah. views on something. It's, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. Doesn't mean that necessarily. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, overall though, I'm definitely, uh, <laughs> while we talked about a lot of negative stuff, I think, uh, these are like issues that can be definitely overcome. And I think that, um, it's friend coined the term, uh, I think they coined it, uh, self unfulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. where as long as we think it's going to be incredibly difficult and put everything we can into it, then it's going to be fine. And if we believe that it's fine, it's going to be very, very difficult and not be overcome. Right. Um, and I think many of the kind of current important issues are these self unfulfilling prophecies and just hope that we care enough and then we will, I think, solve them. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Igor. It's, it's been, uh, it's been fun. I, I had a lot of uh, fun with this conversation and I hope you did as well. Thank you too. Yeah, I did. It was good talking to you. Same here. Same here. Thank you.